And uh, okay, let me introduce Luisa uh, Tapia, uh, who is the director of the multidisciplinary doctoral program in developmental science uh, at the Universidad Mayor de Sant Andres in Las Paz, uh, Bolivia. And uh, Luis is the author of uh, many, many books. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, the pleasure, the privilege, the honor uh, of discussing uh, his last book um, on internal colonialism. And I think we had uh, a terrific conversation. Uh, I am expecting nothing less than the same kind of a conversation today. Um, today, uh, Luisa will offer a uh, kind of a initial approach. Basically, it will introduce uh, us to the work uh, of uh, René Zavaleta Mercado. And, uh, and what we have available over there are two books. One is from René Zavaleta himself, that is, whose, whose title is Towards an History of the National Popular in Bolivia, 1879-1980. And then a book uh, by Luis, The Production of uh, Local Knowledge, that is uh, more uh, what, uh, what he is going to talk about. So local knowledge, social diversity, and as the title says, the future of uh, of democracy. Uh, another thing I wanna I wanna say is uh, that this event, and I hope it's just the first of many, is a result of a collaboration with uh, the Department of uh, Latin American and Latino Studies, so with uh, Fernando and Guillermo, and the group on uh, extractivism and uh, social research cluster. As I said, I hope this is a beginning, a starting point. Uh, okay, I think I, I, I should give the floor to Luis. And uh, as a usual for our speaker series, Luis has uh, 40 minutes, and then we have uh, plenty of time for uh, uh, the conversation. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Massimiliano, uh, for the invitation. And I thank you also very much to the university uh, for um, this opportunity to dialogue with, with you. Uh, my presentation is based on two books. Uh, the first one is the Sabaletas national popular in Bolivia. And uh, my work uh, is called the production of local knowledge. That is a, an epistemological reconstruction of Sabaleta's work. I will begin introducing some of Sabaleta's ideas and I will continue with uh, some of the uh, things I have uh, done with uh, his work. The idea of Sabaleta, or the aim of Sabaleta, was to think Bolivia. Uh, but to do that, he also thought that it's necessary to produce more concepts and to articulate a, a methodological and theoretical strategy that uh, would allow uh, him and us to uh, produce social knowledge in conditions of uh, high uh, and it, uh, social diversity, high uh, heterogeneity. Um, so I will uh, comment some set of concepts that he introduced to uh, to do what I. Uh, I just said, Savaleta had the idea that the, uh, the, the degree of validation and the horizon of validation of general theories, theories has to do with the grade of homogenization of what he called the social substance. 
or social reality. Uh, so he, uh, he saw that the foundation of validation of modern social theories has to do with the grade of homogenization made by the uh, expansion of capitalist uh, social relations. So there is a correspondence between uh, the transformation of social reality under some kind of social relations and the validity of uh, general theories. Uh, social science are a modern product. So he thought that the horizon of validity of uh, these theories is modern times, uh, modern condition. And he made a choice. He chose a Marxist theory to think and explain the uh, modern condition in Bolivia and in other uh, Latin American countries. But he thought that uh, the uh, use of a general theory is not enough because uh, these uh, general theories were thought uh, in reference to European modern conditions homogenized by uh, capitalist uh, social uh, relations. So we uh, uh, face problems when we try to explain the history and the social structures in countries like Bolivia, many others that have experienced colonial uh, rule, because uh, not everything can be subsumed under the causal relations contained in a general theory. The uh, Sabaleta's conclusion is not the denial of general theories, uh, that's, a, that's something that happens in many places in Latin America. People used to think that because that general theory doesn't cover everything in our history, uh, so it's wrong or it's not useful. The idea of Sabaleta is that uh, they, they can be useful, especially uh, the theory of value, if we think its limits. So the first thing to do is to think its limits and then after that to develop a new set of concepts to think what is outside or um, is not covered by the concepts and the way uh, the theory uh, make relations between different dimens dimensions of reality. So most of Savaleta's work is the development of a set of concepts of an intermediate level, a level that is a bridge between a general theory, in this case, the theory of uh, value uh, produced by Marx, and the specific, the particular history of one country, so between the general in modern times and a national uh, history. And uh, he worked on this intermediate level. He, I will introduce uh, some of the concepts that uh, correspond to this uh, intermediate level. The first one is the idea of Matli formation. By Matli formation, Sabaleta thinks the overlapping, a disarticulated overlapping of different kinds of what he called historical times that includes different modes of production, social reproduction, a conceptions of the world, different languages, and also different uh, structures of self-government and political authorities. Uh, this idea of uh, matly formation, matly social formation, comes from the Marxist tradition that used the uh, concept of social uh, formation to talk about the articulation of different modes of production. But generally, 
the idea of social formation was used to think process of transition to capitalism, linked to the belief that in a short or maybe a not a very long time, things will be rearticulated and functionalized in the logic of the reproduction of the dominant mode of production. That means capitalism. I want to highlight that in this use of the idea of social formation, the key is articulation. The difference with the idea of motley formation is disarticulation, is an overlapping and disarticulated overlapping. That means that uh, for a long time, many uh, structures of the uh, conquered societies uh, remain as such, and uh, they have a contact with the dominant structures in a way that produces ambiguity because it moves you know, like level, levels, different levels that moves. That means that something or some structure that in one time might work for the dominant society in some other times can be politicized to uh, produce a crisis in the dominant society. Uh, the key point in the idea of motley formation is that beyond the existence of different languages and identities, is the persistence of political forms. The motley condition is a strong one when uh, persists another kind of political forms of self-government, cut in some sense and uh, sometimes clandestine, but they persist in time. Uh, the other idea that goes with uh, this one of motley formation is the idea of uh, historical times. Uh, Savaleta distinguished two. The first one is the agrarian one that corresponds to the invention of agriculture and the emergence of community structures. That means collective uh, possession of land and a uh, in an assembly type of uh, self-government that persists until now. Uh, this kind of uh, society uh, is linked to the emergence of cyclical conceptions of time. That means that social life follows natural seasons. The other type of historical time that Savaleta distinguished is the industrial one that breaks that cyclical, not only conceptions, but the organization of social life also. Uh, so a motley formation is the overlapping of a agrarian time and industrial uh, time. Uh, and that's stronger uh, in modern times. The other idea that follows from this is that social knowledge is not something that we can produce in a significant way in a, just a, observing a everyday life. Colonial condition makes invisible and, this, uh, and makes a distortion of many things. So uh, Sabaleta thought that in this kind of conditions, crises are the, uh, a better uh, time to widen up the, what he calls the horizon of visibility. Uh, and crisis in this uh, sense and not only implies that there are there is the decomposition of social structures, but the emergence of new subjects or reconstitution of subjects 
that are questioning the dominant ideas, they, that are disarticulating the dominant ideology and are proposing uh, new ones. So the crisis is a, uh, is the product of the emergence of uh, new political subjects. Uh, and what we can produce as social knowledge depends on the on the constitution of the subjects. Uh, in this sense, also uh, the condition of possibility of uh, production of social knowledge not only depends on having good theories, but it depends on the historical configuration. If we have a quiet country uh, uh, without uh, politicization, there are may less things that we can see and know. Uh, the dynamic of political life may widen up the possibility to know more things. That's a strong idea in uh, Savaleta. With this comes the idea of constituent moments. Uh, in a uh, Savaleta articulated a methodological strategy uh, that contains the idea of uh, constituent moments. That means that in a crisis, we uh, identifying a significant crisis, we try to uh, search where it comes, where the structures that are uh, being destroyed or uh, breaking, uh, where they come from. So we go back in time until we uh, identify the constituent moments of what is entering into crisis. Mm -hmm. And then we go forward again, uh, uh, trying to see how it display what is uh, what was in the constituent moment, how it has uh, intermediate crisis, decomposition, new recompositions, until we get to the moment that is the reference of what we are studying or uh, or the present moment. We can do that many times. Once we, we identify a crisis and its constituent moment, we can go back in time many, many more times. Uh, it depends on what we are uh, interested in in, uh, in, the in the historical explanation. Um, link it to this idea, uh, there is also the idea of a primordial form uh, that uh, I, I used to name uh, his theoretical and methodological strategy. By primordial form, he uh, thinks in, in first place the articulation of state and civil society in a national history. That means to think social reality always as a historical construction. And we uh, should also think the mediations between civil society and state and how they change in time. There is a one geopolitical idea linked to that concept. When we have a primordial form constructed uh, by good mediations, that means participation, integration, redistribution, toleration, uh, pluralism, and many other good things, uh, we may have a, a strong primordial form that can resist external determinations or have a wider uh, range to decide uh, the way to receive external determinations. On the other side, uh, when the primordial form was constructed by over-exploitation, racism, uh, exclusion, and many other negative forms of uh, uh, social interaction, 
we have a weak a primordial form that uh, might be determined in a very strong way by external uh, powers, political and economic powers. That's the case of Bolivia, many Latin American countries in the last centuries. We have weak primordial forms. And in, in some moments, historical moments, we try to build a stronger uh, primordial forms that in the case of Bolivia had to do with the national revolution around um, uh, 1952. Uh, this idea of primordial form, I think uh, it's a strong one. So I try to develop it a little uh, introducing two more dimensions following the uh, Sabaleta's logic. I think that uh, under the primordial form, we can also think not only the relation between a state and civil society, that that is the mother condition. If we think only civil and civil society and state, we are only thinking uh, one kind of society that exists inside one country. We are not thinking the motley condition. So to think the motley condition, we, th we have to think the relations between the dominant society with the other kind of societies that exist in the same territory. And the way each one of these has articulated all their dimensions. O sea, to think the primordial form of each of the societies existing, existing in the same country. And the other dimension is to think the way each of these societies relate to nature, how they transform nature to produce uh, the conditions of social life and social reproduction. Uh, that means that we have to think what I have called the multi-societal condition. I think that in Bolivia and in Latin America, in many countries, we don't have only a multicultural society, but we have a multi-societal country. Uh, I don't identify multicultural with multi-societal, multi-societal multi condition contains multicultural uh, multiculturalism, but it's something more uh, stronger. I think that what Zabaleta did in, uh, in our country is a kind of nationalization of Marxism in a way that I call real substantial uh, of theory, using this idea that comes from Marx. Marx introduced the idea of real and formal substantial to talk about different phases of uh, capitalism. Uh, I use it to think uh, the following uh, uh, thing. There is formal substantial when we use a general theory only in a deductive way. We, we use uh, the causal relations that establish a general theory, theory to subsume the local uh, uh, features of a national history and deduct uh, mostly directly an explanation of the particular case. Uh, this way of to proceed usually end, ends up in a cognitive reduction. So we see in Bolivia or Colombia what the general theory uh, uh, able us. I don't know if uh, it's uh, right to to talk like that. What the theory. Um, open us to, to, to see. 
what I call real substantial theory means that there is an appropriation of the theory that it is incorporated in our subjectivity. subjectivity. And that we enter into a theory to know it well. But a real subsumption also means that it's not enough to use well a theory, but we have to develop more concepts. That also means that we may transform the general theory in some uh, aspects. Sabaleta worked in that way. He appropriated Marxism and he developed an intermediate level of new concepts. Um, this intermediate level produced what I call Latin America as an epistemological uh, horizon that uh, works for the following. When we fix the limits of general theories, it also contains a critique of Eurocentrism, the, the pretension of general validity of some set of ideas. Following the Sabaleta works, the Sabaleta work, we see that he tries to think the complexity of particular histories, producing a new set of concepts that begin thinking one case, one history. But these ideas can be generalized to an intermediate level because they can be used to think Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and some other similar places with all the differences we have, but without trying to uh, convert uh, the theory in, in a new uh, general one. So we criticize the limits of general theories. We produce more intermediate uh, an intermediate sets of concepts, and we generalize them to an intermediate level. So uh, it's not a complete substitution of ideas. It's just a complementary uh, development of an intermediate level. Marx's work uh, excuse me, Sabaleta work with uh, the uh, theory of value of Marx and the theory of hegemony of uh, Gramsci to think uh, the uh, homolog homologization in modern times using Marx and to think the historical construction of, can of countries uh, using Gramsci. Um, articulated, articulating both he developed this intermediate uh, set of uh, ideas. I, I think that what Sabaleta did, did is something that I call a theoretical baroque. I use the idea of Alejo Carpentier, a, a, a Cuban writer, who thought that the baroque is the fear of the void. And to confront that, uh, people develop a, a set of proliferating nuclei to uh, fill up the gap. Uh, and I use that idea to make a correspondence between the idea of motley formation and the kind of th theory that Sabaleta developed to think that. I think that the theoretical Baroque is what corresponds to a motley formation in a, a theoretical level. In the uh, epistemological reconstruction of Sabaleta's work, I have tried to identify what is the core of the strategy. Uh, I use the idea of Lakatos, um, the idea of the uh, research programs. 
he uh, identifies what he calls the fixed core or nuclei. In the case of Zabaleta, that core is the theory of value. Zabaleta never explained uh, the, theor the theor theory of value in his texts. He just used it to think what happens in politics, in culture, and uh, historical processes. He didn't make any development on value theory in the uh, in the economic uh, sense. I think that is the fixed core, and around that he developed this intermediate level where there are the ideas of motley formation, constituent moments, primordial form. I call them intermediate because. Those are the bridge between the general theory, theory of value, and the uh, concepts that he also produced to think the specificity of Bolivia that cannot be generalized to Peru, uh, Ecuador, and to anything uh, to anything uh, else. Uh, so I think that the structure of his works uh, has a. a these uh, parts, a core, the theory of value, an intermediate set of uh, concepts, and uh, many uh, specific concepts just to think Bolivian and Bolivian history. There is another thing that I would like to comment. Uh, Savaleta saw the constituent moments to explain how through time there are some determinative charges of the past that recreate in new constituent moments. And the main one is the recreation of the determinative charge of the agrarian moment. That is a pre-Columbian one that has been recreated uh, through many other constituent moments until now, because we had the reproduction of uh, community structures and agrarian culture. Uh, in Bolivia, uh, about 80% are of indigenous origin. And many uh, of those people still live in community structures, uh, territories organized by uh, a very uh, old and agrarian culture. And the better example of the strength of these uh, determinative charges of the past is the emergence of the idea of a plurinational state in the Andean zone in the last decades in Bolivia and Ecuador. And after that, it's something that is also spreading in Argentina and Chile in some degree. That means that the, uh, the agrarian constituent moment is still determining in a strong uh, sense the present because it led to constituent assemblies and reforms of the state. The uh, alternative political projects in the Andean, Andean zone, the last years, came from this agrarian constituent moment, not from modernity. The, the people who articulate that project also articulate some modern uh, forms with uh, ancient agrarian forms, but the force of the uh, emergence of the projects come from the agrarian one. Uh, one uh, last uh, thing. Uh, I think that the uh, epistemological reconstruction of uh, Zabaleta's strategy uh, might also help to uh, widen up the capacity to explain uh, our history. But uh, I have to take care to say that 
uh, following Zabaleta, the main condition for social knowledge is the political and historical configuration. Uh, we can translate the idea of uh, Kant, the, the question for the conditions of possibility of knowledge that he, uh, he thought that were transcendental categories in the uh, Sabaletan, Sabaletian uh, perspective, the idea is that these conditions are the uh, historical political ones, mostly the kind of subjects that are, constitute, cons are constituted in uh, each moment, in each society, in each history. Most of his work was uh, um, built on what in the country we used, we used to call proletarian centrality. That means the capacity of the labor movement to articulate society more than the dominant class. We had in, in Bolivia, we had a, a weak primordial form and a weak state because uh, the dominant class didn't articulate a nation. Uh, unless a nation state. Uh, that happened around the labor movement. So Sabaleta thought that uh, his uh, kind of a strategy uh, is the way to think what the labor movement articulated as an horizon of visibility. That horizon was widened up in the Bolivian history by the emergence of the peasant movement with autonomy, intellectual and moral autonomy at the end of the 70s in Bolivia. And that was widened up one, once more at the end of the century by the emergence of the indigenous movement. So now in Bolivia, we not only have a modern vision, a critical vision of our history using Marxism, but we have a, a more complex vision of our history because we had to articulate peasant vision and the indigenous conceptions of the world to uh, understand and explain uh, our history. That's what I would uh, present as a synthesis to have a dialogue with, with you. That was fantastic, was really great. And uh, I, oh yeah. Uh, and uh, many, many questions. But I have something to say. Uh, I start. <laughs> I, because I'm sitting here, I feel obliged to start. And also obliged to say that I think it's a misfortune that uh, our colleagues, uh, some of them are students, are not friends. This conversation was really crucial and critical for a lot of staff. We are discussing all the time on this campus and elsewhere. This is a, my translation, my understanding of what uh, 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 Louise just uh, told us. And then you can say, Max, you misunderstand me, you misunderstood me, and I will be happy because I will learn how to correct myself. So, what I understand and what is crucial for the conversation we are having here on this campus and the contribution, your contribution and Zavaleta's contribution is, uh, is this idea of an intermediate uh, level of knowledge. And, and my understanding is like put together different pieces is uh, that on the one hand, we can say that uh, we have a, a kind of a abstract form of knowledge in the case of Marx is the the theory of value. Uh, one can also say that uh, this uh, more abstract level of knowledge uh, is uh, the idea of society that emerged 
from the binary or the opposition between state and society. And that in the in a general knowledge that can become a normative idea of society and become it can become even colonial because that is the only way society exists and should exist and, uh, and in a kind of a teleological way and then there are three modern uh, forms of society or residual form of society but when we absolutize the abstract level we have a form of domination and the form of a colonial domina domination that is both real with with a real violence legal economic violence and uh, epistemic violence but they work together uh, so the absolutization of this uh, this uh, first level uh, I think it leads to a form of a, you know, abstract thinking that is in itself a form of domination. Mm -hmm. When I say, you know, this is converse, these are conversations which are going on is because uh, it's a kind of a common place today, uh, especially in some part of the US to criticize this uh, abstract form of knowledge. But then people usually go into the opposite and the opposite is uh, something that uh, you address the opposite uh, or the other pole of, uh, of this uh, articulation is the or are the many concrete social formations when you absolutize the many concrete social formations without a general theory basically you have another part of the conversation that is the dominant uh, uh, in this part of the world. You have ontologies and you have ontologies which are incommensurable with each other and you have just to take it and there is nothing you can do with that. Just uh, uh, learn and respect the plurality of ontologies. But, uh, but uh, I think in your effort, uh, Luis and Zavaletas in conversation is, is to give us this is a kind of a intermediate level in which basically you have a neither nor. You don't work only with the abstract form of knowledge that corresponds to a dominant form of understanding. Your society as just the opposite of the state. You don't have a, only the ontologies, what today people call ontologies. You have a concrete social formation and then what I understand that I think is, uh, is fascinating is that uh, knowledge emerged in this uh, kind of uh, intermediate level in which you need to produce uh, new concepts, terms, uh, categories in order to uh, basically to question the abstract level of knowledge on the basis of something particular. But at the same time, you have to go back and to reproduce a certain level of uh, 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 general uh, concepts uh, in order to understand what is going on at the level of uh, all these uh, particularities, because otherwise you get lost in the particular. And you, and you don't have knowledge. Mm -hmm. Or you don't have a, 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 a knowledge, shareable knowledge. You, you, you have just the islands. But then, and then, and then, and then, and then and I said, this is my last comment, I promise this. Uh, is a, that this experiment uh, is not, uh, or this uh, practice is not only an epistemic practice in order to produce knowledge, but what I see is that uh, this knowledge is also produced in a real tension. So between the two levels, the society that is uh, shaped by the state and becomes normative, mm -hmm. almost teleological, this is what so society should look like. This is Western society, the society of individuals, and then all the different particular social formations between these different levels, layers, there is always tension. And what I think is fascinating is that to acknowledge and to work with the fact that the knowledge, knowledge has produced in this tension. So knowledge is the result of something that emerged in a, not only in epistemic, but also in a concrete battlefield between these uh, two tensions. So when we practice knowledge, when we know something, when we want to know something, when we produce knowledge is a production, is a real production. We are in that battlefield. We are part of a struggle. It's not, a, it's not a, 
It's not something that uh, you can do by sitting in your comfortable room and uh, wearing your slippers. Uh, and uh, no, it's a, it's a battle. You are in this tension. This is what I, what I got from, from this uh, amazing reconstruction. And, and again, I think it's something, something that has to be, I don't know, maybe has to be translated, not just at the level of a language, but I think at the level of a, a terminologies, a terms. A, 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 Fernando said something about that. Is because, because I think it, it, it's something that is, could be extremely useful for the current conversation, intellectual and political conversation mm -hmm. around us. Mm -hmm. Can I build on that? Fernando and Bahano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, without going back to that intermediate level and, you know, rejecting kind of the general, the main general particularities, without going back to that, to that intermediate level, which, which gives you a sense of, of articulation of totality, you not only cannot produce knowledge, but you, can, you cannot produce transformative politics because you cannot produce subjects, historical subjects, historical subjects that, that have to be in that tension that you, that, that you mentioned under this question, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, that's where the, 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 the getting bogged down in the, in the particular ontologies and the politics of identity you know, which seems like a really progressive move forward, rejecting this totalizing uh, meta narratives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if we don't engage in that intermediate level through this notion of of a monthly society, which which is an articulation, it's an articulated totality, right? You you not only lose knowledge, the possibility of producing knowledge, but you but you know what I just said, transformative politics. Yeah. And I think that's the that's that's as how far we have to push this, you know, the, the contribution that that, that Ernest Alvita and, and Luis, uh, Luis's work uh, uh, does uh, for us here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, thank you. This was really, really interesting. And I uh, must admit, I know I've never read Zabaleta. I know nothing about his theory. So forgive me if I maybe don't understand the, the whole project. But um, I, I found a, a, a question about um, how his reconstruction of what I understood from uh, uh, your presentation uh, as a takeaway point is uh, that one of Zamaleta's main contributions to um, uh, thinking about uh, social formations is a kind of acknowledgement of their complexity, uh, internal complexity that is irreducible to considerations of multiculturalism and uh, diversity and stuff like that. It's like a, both historical and social complexity of social formations um, that then he injects in a Marxist uh, uh, framework of the specific histories um, uh, of the social formation he's looking at. So I wanted to ask you to speak to the political implications a little bit of this uh, a theoretical framework, if I've understood uh, uh, correctly, especially in light of contemporary tendencies toward, um, and I'm here thinking of populist currents in politics, where uh, one of the main points is to kind of unify those different segments, uh, historical traditions, uh, groups, social groupings, and to kind of um, uh, assert uh, a unity out of the complexity. So like, how does his thought uh, maybe guide us uh, in analyzing the present, in the, especially if we consider the present to be a kind of a resurgence of the populist uh, uh, moment? Mm -hmm. And then the, the second question I had, which is completely unrelated, because you mentioned that um, Zavaleta works with the law of value. Uh, uh, I, I wondered if 
uh, you could sort of situate him uh, in an, you know, intellectual, like a global intellectual map. Uh, like if you if you were to do that, like who would you consider him uh, close to? So one of the thinkers, for example, that immediately came to my mind as someone who does something kind of interesting with the law of value is Yevgeny Pashkanis, who tried to think of Soviet law uh, from the perspective of the uh, uh, value theory. Um, uh, and again, kind of in tension with the Western dominant uh, vocabularies and uh, literature. So I, I wondered like if um, you were to place the letter, like who would you consider him uh, kind of close to or in kinship with uh, on the global map of, of uh, theoreticians uh, who use value theory uh, and or something close to that. Anyway, thank you so much. Well, first I should say that Massimiliano explained very much better what I, I try to do. Thank you very much. I will use it. <laughs> um, and I would say something about what you talk about before I enter to your question. Uh, Sabaleta used to say that I will say if, uh, um, a sentence in Spanish, and I will try to explain it. Conoce más el que se mueve más. That means that people who know, may know more, is people who moves more in a social sense. Not as a tourist, no? being in many places, but people who moves beyond his corporate, his corporate or their corporate place. That means that it's uh, interacts with other classes uh, in other regions of the same country between uh, uh, many countries, uh, people from many countries. That's why he thought that uh, the labor movement that was the subject who uh, did that in Bolivia, that articulated more than any other many fractions of classes uh, in the sense to articulate the nation, was the condition of he what that moment articulated what he called the horizon of disability. Yeah, I think uh, you said something like that, no? that knowledge depends on how you move in society. Uh, and you also mentioned struggle because that means that this movement is a political movement uh, and uh, it has to do with the struggle against the uh, dominant bloc. Going to what you have uh, put as a question, uh, I will go first with um, the relation with another Theory, theory fixed. I think Savaleta was very close to Gramsci beyond Marx, you know, using Marx uh, and maybe Mariategui. I'm thinking of uh, thinkers of the beginning of the 20th century. I'm, I can't find more contemporary thinkers that I will uh, found very close to Savaleta. Maybe there are, but I'm, I'm not identifying. Mm -hmm. He was friend of uh, many people who work on dependency theory, like um, the Brazilian ones, the, uh, people like Agustin Cueva, who was a critic, but he was a friend, but they didn't think uh, the same. Because the idea of Savaleta was, uh, there's something I didn't mention here uh, today. There is a priority of the 
reconstruction of the uh, internal social structures over the uh, external determinations. And in his times, the 70s, the 80s, uh, the dependency theory was very strong, was still strong. And he had the idea that the dependency theory privileges the external determinations to explain what happens uh, inside. Uh, inclusive now, for example, the uh, present uh, party in government in Bolivia uh, blames everything to uh, U.S. imperialism. And that avoids to think the internal uh, complexity and contradictions. Um, so Sabaleta was friends of many of these people, but uh, he thought that uh, we should uh, privilege the internal reconstruction. So uh, I'm not finding something that should be very or that is very close to his way of thinking. Maybe there is. Uh, he died in 1984, uh, Sabaleta. So I was, until now, I can't identify. Um, so meanwhile, I go to the political consequences. First, I will try to in interpret what's in Zabaleta's writings, in the idea of the national popular that names the, the book of Zabaleta. He was, or he had the idea that we, well, he didn't say this, that we have to have a, and regulative idea of a general idea or idea of how to uh, react uh, in motley conditions or how we should politically act in motley conditions as a general strategy. He didn't uh, uh, stop that. What he did is to pay attention to the historical forms that emerge in histories in Bolivia, in, in the countries that uh, he knew. And that's something that changes. The idea of the national popular, in the case of Zabaleta, is used to name the historical forms that emerge in many moments. I don't know how to pronounce well. Co conjunctus is the word that uh, in which people experience forms of fusion of uh, people from different classes and regions, conceptions of the world, met and practice a special form of struggle against the state. Uh, so the alternatives are not thought before the struggle, but what he did was to think the forms that emerge in political struggle in local histories. And he named the national popular to those many forms of uh, political fusion. And in the case of Bolivia, uh, what uh, he uh, uh, tried to identify in those experiences is the charge of self-determination. And the idea is that self-determination doesn't have a general form in all cases. It takes different forms. In some cases uh, that we have experienced in Bolivian history was the centrality of labor movement. That meant that every organization in the country participated in the decisions made in the uh, Central Union and uh, accepted that the uh, political direction of the country was that uh, in Bolivia we call Central Obrera Boliviana, the labor movement. And 
For example, that was the alternative for a long time in Bolivia, for many decades, uh, uh, proletarian centrality. But that was disarticulated. And at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the new one, emerged a new form of articulation and fusion that was called Pacto de Unidad. Un um, Unity, Unity Pact. That's the articulation between uh, indigenous assemblies of community territories, the peasant unions, and the assemblies of what we call lowlands and highlands that are uh, that they have different cultures. And they made a block where they imagine the idea of a plurinational state. That's a different configuration. It's not the labor movement uh, as a center, but a confederation of uh, indigenous and peasant organizations. And they articulated the alternative for the country. That is a different one. But if we generalize a little bit, uh, I could say that the alternative is the emergence of or to work for uh, the articulation of some form of uh, organizations that um, practice self-determination and they uh, experience a kind of fusion or articulation to rethink how to reform the whole country. Um, I think that was his way to think. Um, another way to think this is to link the idea of monthly formation and the question what kind of political form would correspond to that um, as a critic of the uh, present uh, state of things mm -hmm. and the state in a strict sense. One way in Bolivian history and in Ecuador is the idea of a plurinational state. Uh, in the case of Bolivia, people had very clear why we need a plurinational form and what of their culture should be in there, but we didn't get to imagine what we the substitute form of the national state. In the most developed pro political project that was made by Unity Pact, Pact uh, they go up to the idea of indigenous autonomy. That means to recognize the uh, ways of uh, self-government of different cultures. But we didn't imagine yet how to co-rule the country. And for that, we need some other forms that doesn't exist, or some form that doesn't exist. Uh, and uh, there appears one tension or contradiction. The idea of a plurinational state was thought to integrate cultures that don't have a state as part of their society with a modern uh, state form. So uh, indigenous movements still use the idea of a state to name the way that should overcome the, the national state. In that sense, I, I think that we also have to overcome the idea of plurinational state to develop a, a more practical a way to have another way to organize political life and, and government in, in a country like Bolivia. But uh, I would say one more thing. In a monthly condition, what you have is different political forms. We don't have only modern forms. So the first thing, the first thing we have to confront is the existence of different political forms, 
of organizing and also of self uh, determination. Uh, and I think that we have to preserve that, no? the different forms of self determination and invent new ones, mostly in urban areas that, where we don't have a, we don't have that uh, anymore. Uh, That's what I would say now. Other questions? Any comments? These are comments. You know, one is this notion, your notion, at uh, least of theoretical baroque. I think that's a really useful. I mean, if you could speak a little bit more, uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, fear of the void, uh, borrowing from, from Alejo. Uh, but does, is it linked to Bolivar Echeverria, so to how Veronica Gago uses also this notion of baroque uh, economia baroca? You know, so so how do you situate your your notion of of theoretical baroque in that broader broader context? Uh, so that's the first question, and and then the second one is, can there be another constituent moment? Um, you know, because constituent moments are charged with so much potency. You know, the, there's the, the, the organization of production, politics, culture, imaginary subjectivities. Can there be a, a, can crises or can the, these fusion moments, can they produce a new constituent moment? Uh, you know, or, or is that not understanding the category? Okay. That, that's my favorite. One question is that uh, what is the Spanish for monthly, monthly formation? Abigarramiento, so, si, formación abigarrada. Sociedad abigarrada. It's better social or monthly to use formation because the idea of uh, monthly is that you have many societies. <laughs> That's why I use the idea of multi societal condition or social, multi societal kind. Um, about the Baroque, I work on this idea before I read uh, Bolivar Echeverria's works. And the work of Veronica Gago is. Uh, it's more recent, so I didn't I didn't use uh, the idea of, um, of any of those uh, authors. I just use the idea of um, Alejo Carpentier, and uh, the, the reason is that I was doing some graphs of the conceptual structure of Zabaleta, the Spanish uh, version of the book contains these graphs. No? How is the structure? Uh, in the center is the theory of value uh, about what uh, Zabaleta never wrote. It just, it's invisible in the text. Uh, and I began to organize the concepts, the intermediate uh, ones and the more specific ones. So I saw in, in the paper that uh, was that was a kind of a baroque structure. Mm -hmm. no? So we don't have just one one general or one set of general ideas which, or just one, and the rest is deducted from mm -hmm. that, but many proliferating nuclei. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I found the correspondence in a graphic way. And then I work a little bit on the theoretical relationship. Maybe I didn't use well the word. I mean, to fill the empty spaces. The, uh, the idea uh, when I was talking of the graph is that you don't have a big center 
and many specific concepts, but many levels. And Zabaleta work on different sets of to fill the empty spaces and to make bridges between those levels. That was the sense of maybe I didn't use well the, the word. May I just go ahead and just one more? Uh, you mentioned something about the unless assumption and the formal assumption, so assumption in terms of theoretical knowledge of something. So th this would be an example of this sort of methodology of like taking a general theory or an abstract theory and applying it to other understandings like the world or, or so on. Like, because I mean, as, as I recall, the real subsumption and the formal subsumption and Marx has to do with the introduction of industry and like a very materialistic and economic way of understanding history. But if, if you apply this to theory and therefore to subjectivity, this is this is this kind of like uh, uh, it's part of what um, you are uh, proposing. As a as a method, is is there a method in in this kind of movement, this resignification? I don't know if I'm making sense. I think I understand the question. Uh, it's not a method. This idea of uh, substantial, <clears throat> it's a way I interpret the work that Savaleta did. But I think. Uh, with this, there is uh, this difference in Marx's idea. Substantial is used to think how, in some moment, capitalism transforms in a total way the modes of work, the the way to think. Mostly means cultural homogenization. So when you get into a real substantial, you are getting into one way to, to view the world. Uh, so that cannot be called what Sabaleta does because he couldn't think motley conditions. No? And that uh, would uh, let him think the modern way, uh, way of living and the modern way of organizing social life. So I think that's only one feature of uh, Savaleta work. He appropriates um, Marxism. Uh, but I, I now uh, could add to what I said b uh, before, that his work leads to combine this kind of a real substantial, that means to work with a general theory, that is... Um, that goes with uh, some sense of historicity. Yes. Marx and Savaleta didn't think that the value of theory uh, is useful to think all, all times and all kinds of. It only is uh, it's good to think modern times. Yeah. Well, he combines this general theory with some craft work. I, uh, I don't know if it's the right way to, to say it. So you to explain a national history, you have to, de to do a, a craft work to articulate the uh, specific features of national life. And in that, in that process, you can use these intermediate level ideas to link it to uh, more general ideas. Uh, so you can have not only explanation of Bolivia, for example, but of Bolivia in the history of the world mm -hmm. uh, and how the world history penetrates uh, Bolivian history also. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is another thing. I think what Savaleta does is the production of a set of concepts that is a way to open to another conceptions of the world. That means that Savaleta is a modern subject. He's thinking 
uh, uh, using Marxism, that is a modern theory. But he knows that he has to understand things that are not modern, societies that are not modern. But to think that modern concepts are not enough. But it's not, the thing is that you, it's not enough just to listen and to see other cultures or subjects that speak from other cultures, but you have to prepare theoretically to listen and understand other cultures. So you have to do a work on your subjectivity mm -hmm. to prepare to understand other things. Because if you only have modern ideas yeah, with the, is that the word pretension in English? Yeah. With the pretension of universal validity, you won't understand well uh, other people. So you have to reform your uh, theoretical subjectivity to open up to uh, another cultures. So that means that the other part of this uh, explanation, historical explanation, it has to do with interaction with what other people think. In the case of Bolivia, with what Qataristas think or people from other cultures think. So you can have a complete explanation of your history in your own terms. That's enough. No? You, have, you prepare a matrix to open to another conceptions of the world. And that's another feature, I think, of the work of Savaleta. That's a way of decentering a, a Eurocentrism. But within modern or in modern terms, not uh, about, uh, leaving aside the, uh, the modern way of uh, thinking, because uh, he was a modern thinker, mm -hmm. as I am also. I have a question. Um, you mentioned about these uh, agrarian moments that uh, remain alive in the present. And it is from these agrarian moments that uh, 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 certain concepts like the plurinational state uh, get inserted into the constitutions of uh, Bolivia or Ecuador, uh, for example, or also concepts like Summa Capsai. How it is that um, these concepts that translate from uh, these cultures that are alive get inserted into colonial constitutions and uh, what, what, what it is happening there? It, it is that these concepts get uh, neutralized and stop uh, working as they were in these uh, agrarian moments. Or do you see uh, when these concepts are inserted into modern constitutions, there is the possibility of transforming these colonial constitutions into something that get away from um, uh, from forms of domination. I don't know if it is. Uh, I think uh, to answer this is useful the idea of overdetermination as uh, Althusser used it. Uh, indigenous movements uh, imagine the idea of plurinational states that should contain the recognition of their. Uh, political forms of self-government, no? the forms of authority uh, that follow the idea of rotation in the mm -hmm. in the position of uh, authority. Uh, and those political forms are not state forms. But they thought that they a new uh, form of government in Bolivia that uh, should be democratic should include them and those forms as a demand first. But they named that project plurinational state. That means that the idea of the recognition of their political forms was transformed into the state form. 
I would say that kind of society, when you use it to reform, uh, introducing some community structures in uh, modern conditions, they are transformed. And what happened in Bolivia and Ecuador, it's is that not only the name has been changed, or but the uh, what we had in practice is the reproduction of the old state, of the national state. Uh, in the case of Bolivia, the new constitution recognizes these political forms of uh, ancient cultures, but in a I, it's hard to pronounce for me this hierarchy, hierarchical uh, way. The, uh, the Constitution says we recognize them, but uh, to the extent that it not contradict the universal uh, rights that are thought in a liberal way. Uh, so you can uh, go uh, self-govern only in your place, but you cannot participate in the government of the country with your forms. So you can enter the national government, but assuming the state forms. That's what's happening in Bolivia. So we have a distorted recognition or inclusion that... Uh, so what happened is we didn't include communal forms of government, but we all we only included people, some per, uh, individuals, but are uh, doing politics uh, as always, no, in in a stateless in a state uh, form. Uh, so I think that they transform, uh, and uh, I can join two ideas. On one side, we have the, this determin, determin, determinative charges of the past. Most of them are the colonial ones, also the negative ones, and the positive ones that led to the plurinational idea. But once they enter in the modern space, they are transformed and they are subsumed under the state form. That's what we have now. I don't think that it will all, always happen that way, but that's what happened in recent times. Can I go to the So you, you would think that the modern could be, uh, and in the framework in the state, could be uh, a place uh, that, that can, uh, can be heavily modified by uh, indigenous concepts uh, and experiences uh, like for example, Summa Corsa, you think that they could be that they could transform modern constitutions, or you think that the modern constitution uh, it is not the right uh, the right place, and whenever these concepts are inserted, they are going to be neutralized. Well, I think that constitutions have been changed, introducing some of these forms. But they are in the paper. No? The main thing is how you could transform the real social relations. That didn't happen. Uh, so uh, I would say that you can transform constitutions. And in some sense, those constitutions may be useful to transform some material and social relations but they are not the only key to transform social reality. Uh, now we are experiencing that they didn't transform uh, almost anything. Uh, they included uh, indigenous autonomy. And if uh, that would uh, mean, that could be a real transformation, not a total transformation, but they are not working. For example, that we would have a territory 
where there is a, a real uh, toleration of another ways of uh, of uh, political authorities, but they have been denying the practice. Mm -hmm. no? So I don't think that the constitution per se uh, can do the transformation, but uh, I think it's not totally useless. No? Right. I, I want to jump on this conversation about, about the constitution. So with, a, with an example, when when the Russian brought the first constitution in 1918, a constitution right after the revolution, a constitution that gave each Soviet, even local Soviet, like the Soviet of uh, the UC campus uh, in Santa Cruz, they gave uh, each Soviet, every Soviet, the right to be independent, autonomous, uh, to, to recognize citizenship. So the Soviet of this campus could give you citizen, American US citizenship and the right to succeed. So the, 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 the confederation was pushed so far that each Soviet could become an independent republic. So now think in parallel, what you know, you can apply a similar constitutional framework to indigenous communities and local communities. To your question, what is interesting is that the, the European, the Western European legal scholar say, this is not a constitution. This is a, this is a, this is a jump back into Middle Ages. Be why? Because that extreme pluralism, what Luis, I agree with Luis, is not compatible with the grammar of a, of a modern constitution. It's just not com compatible. You can do it, but then they have something that a legal scholar would have said, oh, this is not a constitution because you break a unity, you break a sovereignty, you break to time, you break all the basic concepts which are necessary in order to write a constitution, but you, you, you break all of them. And I think this is the interesting thing. I think, I think this, is, uh, this is where things can be pushed today. So I think not in the, in the, in the, in the, in the at the intellectual level, but in this uh, intermediate level, in the interaction between, or the conflict between tension, between, between theory and all these uh, real social practices. And, and a, very, very, a question for you, because I don't, I, 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 when we call this a difference for social formation non-modern, I had the same problem when I wrote my book, I, I, Obviously, we don't want to call them pre-modern, that is teleological, so no way we can use pre-modern. And then I used non-modern, but I was not happy about that because uh, to call them non-modern is just another way to acknowledge that there is a, a, a dominant modernity and, and, you, and you lack something. You lack the, the kind of a modernity that is the normative one uh, and you define yourself only you know, in opposition to what is dominant. And, and I was thinking in a certain way, what I'm talking about, these, these communities are modern. They just went in, in, a, in a different direction. They have a different trajectory, but they are modern because uh, they had the same amount of time available to change and to modify themselves. So we are not talking about a community that is uh, immobile, static in time. They change and therefore, I don't know, what do we do? What can we do with this term? So should we just um, call them different modernities, alternative modernities? I think some people did it. Or, or, or I don't know, it's an open question. Just because I remember I was writing non-modern, non-modern, non-modern many times. I was, no, I, I, I was not there. Should we hear her or yes, sir, sure. Sure. Um, Yeah, this is something come up very spontaneously after listening to both of you talking about material, talking about constitution. And I do understand uh, what the film by saying about like how it's like, incompatible and just doesn't fit, right? Loses power, maybe changes other aspects of society, but I'm thinking about the recent process, not talking about Bolivia or 
or in Peru. The threat may be extrapolated too far, but thinking about Chile and the demands in Peru right now about the importance of uh, convocar um, to ask for a new Asamblea Constituyente to write a new constitution, like the the semiotic, like the the power it has, even though I understand the theoretical aspect of what you're saying, but what it means for the political movements, what it means for the political, like the political aspects of like the real day-to-day -day life, like people in the streets are demanding another constitution with the aspiration that will maybe, right? But what I'm understanding is that it's never gonna happen. So, but what what is your um your take, your opinion, your reflections on the process itself, like the process of um refundar el país. You know, because that's also like at least discursively, that is something that it comes a lot in the protests in the streets with people like we need a new constitution que refunde el estado because what we have right now so, and of course it's very discursive and yeah. But what are your thoughts about it? Where 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 does that does that fit like in the middle of what you're saying? Uh that's between like is that tension between these two? A moment is is that the middle? Like I don't know. That was just a thought. First, I will address what you said about non modern. I face that proper that problem constantly. Uh, mostly, I try to use when I use non modern, just a, as a generalization to refer to forms that are not modern without an evolutionary sense of the of the con of the, the name and the concept but it, in most cases it charges that sense also uh, not in my opinion but uh, as a communication it, it has its uh, uh, meaning also uh, so i try to I try to not use it. I just use it when I try to be uh, synthetic. But I try to develop uh, uh, another way to how can I say the enfrentar face. to face you, to, to face uh, this problem, following Sabaleta's ideas. He distinguished, as I said uh, before, two kinds of historical moments, the uh, agrarian one and the industrial one. I also uh, included a third uh, kind of historical time that uh, until now I call it nomad, nomad historical time. And that is because uh, in Bolivia, the social diversity contains the majority of the uh, different cultures are of nomad uh, origin. Uh, of the 36 that the constitution now recognizes, 32 at least are uh, of a nomad uh, origin. Many of them have transformed in time. Um, and sometimes they go back and forward to they are uh, articulated to capitalism. They go back seeking uh, what they call la tierra sin mal. Uh, so when I refer to no modern uh, social forms, I try to use uh, agrarian societies, or agra agrarian cultures, or nomad uh, formations. Uh, I try to use this kind of, uh, of names, uh, trying not to uh, include the, uh, an evolutionary sense of the history. But there is another dimension that I will have to think um, after uh, hearing you, that has to do with time in, in another sense. This uh, difference between agrarian, nomad, and modern ones, uh, 
a modern one uh, uh, historical time uh, is it uh, our difference of historical time time you said that uh, each uh, uh, society experiences time and it develops and uh, changes in time um, I don't know how to include that uh, uh, in this way to name uh, this difference. Trying not to imply that uh, no modern societies don't move, they don't experience transformation. Um, I have to work on that. Yeah. Um, the, the, the way I, I, I try to solve the problem is to think in terms of a temporal layers. So they coexist in the same present, but they are different layers, like a stratification. Mm -hmm. And each layer change in time. Sometimes they have a different pace when they change. But the, what do you get by thinking in terms of the layers mm -hmm. is that is, is, is like in the geological layers, you have a friction. This, this, uh, there, is a, there, is always a, there are always a friction from between these layers. And, and this is kind of a, a tension we, we were talking about. Walter Benjamin thought of this kind of movement. Mm -hmm. Inclusive in modern conditions, no? there we have many levels yeah. that cannot let that doesn't let us see everything at the same time. That is more complicated in a monthly formation. No? Uh, I will refer to what you were thinking. Uh, it's true that people want a new constitution. They demanded a new constitution in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in many other places. But the experience was also that with that constitution, things didn't change. And in that constitution didn't enter all the things people wanted because they were controlled by the dominant party mostly. And I, so I think that what is important is the social and historical experience. I will comment this based on historical experience and recent history. For example, I think that in the uh, following time, people will remember less the new Bolivian constitution than the experience of the Coordinadora del Agua in Cochabamba. For people experience a real experience of self-determination. They articulated many kinds of organizations, they deliberated and decided how to resist neoliberalism, inclusive how to imagine the constituent assembly. They had a proposal that was not the way we had the constituent assembly. But I think what is what would be the condition of the transformation are the historical experience by which people try to experiment another way of, orga of organizing political life and after that to reform also economic and social life. Uh, so if you, if you want to transform society, it's not enough a new constitution if it's not based on a new social experiments and experiences of uh, uh, and other ways of organizing economy, uh, production, reproduction, and political life. Uh, so I think that in, in a historical perspective, uh, movements, political and social movements, rearticulate experiences of the past that have worked in this way, that were part of an alternative way of living, you know, social and political living. So in a new moment of the struggle, 
I think we have to rearticulate, recreate, for example, the experience of the uh, water war and the Coordinadora del Agua in Bolivia, that I think is the main experience for the urban uh, people. Because in the in communitarian uh, territories, they have their own uh, self-organizing and uh, forms of self-government, uh, subordinated to the national state now, that, but that could be uh, strengthened in, a, a, in another political movement. Uh, I think there are the two things in these movements, in the last decades, in many of our countries, people wanted a new constitution and move and fight for that. But I think that the main thing is not the text, but the experience of how people organize to demand that. For example, in the Bolivian case, the most important thing, the other uh, good experience, is how was articulated Pacto de Unidad. That means how these organizations unify all the communities of the same culture, how they unify between different cultures in the same uh, uh, big assembly, and how they united with unions and deliberated through many uh, years uh, a political project. Uh, I think we should uh, think not only constitution as a text in paper, but as an articulation of many political experiences that could be the material base of uh, a real reform. The bad thing is that many of these experiences were disarticulated, but they are not forgotten, so we can rearticulate in time. We have time for a last question or comment. Uh, I want to go back to this idea of constituent movement. Uh, we have the agrarian constituent movement, the industrial constituent movement. Are we living through a digital constituent? I know the only two possibilities. You know what I'm saying? What what constitutes? Uh, why do we have only the agrarian and the industrial? What what is the constituent moment that today is, you know, articulating the process of production of social reproduction, of uh, politics, of culture, of uh, you know, the, the the how power is exercised. So so that's that's that was my my question again. You know what what uh, what defines the constituent moment? Are we able to experience a new constituent? Moment? I mean, what are the borders of that of that of that you know really potent process? Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Excuse me, I forgot to comment what you <laughs> in the Sabaleta's work. There is a difference between. I would say it in a better way. He distinguishes constituent moments of different profundidad. How can I say that? Yeah, different depths. Yeah. That has to do with the scale mm -hmm. and the, well, you can only know the strength of that uh, constituent moment afterwards. Right. You know? right. It depends on how long it determinates uh, an organized social life. So the big ones are the agrarian moment yeah. and the industrial one. But before that, or after that, uh, people experience another more, less intense constituent moments. For example, the moments of, uh, of national state uh, constitution or national revolutions. For example, in the case of Bolivia, the national national revolution in 1952 is a constituent moment, yeah. and the criterion he uses is uh, in modern times, uh, 
constituted moments are moments in which the primordial form is replaced or reconfigured in a significant way. So the way a uh, mode of production and uh, the form of government uh, changes in a significant way, no? and other dimensions of social life. So uh, you, uh, we can distinguish different depths yeah. of uh, of constituency. Yeah. Uh, there are we don't have only the the big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those correspond to the historical times. Yeah. Uh, but we had a, a less uh, a stronger uh, constituent moments that may last um, three decades or four decades. Uh, that's what uh, we have, what, what we experience more constantly, you know? but not always. Okay. I remember that in your previous uh, part, uh, opinion, you ask for the um, constituent assembly. I think uh, a constituent assembly may be part of the constituent moment. That was the idea in Bolivia, that with a new constituent assembly, we, we would complete or add one important part to the historical accumulation of forces that come from the the struggle of the uh, two or three decades, uh, the previous decades. And it, it not ends with the constituent assembly, but as an important part. But what happened in Bolivia is that um, that constituent assembly controlled by the new government uh, disarticulated the potence yeah. of, of all the that historical accumulation, so that didn't the uh, constituent assembly assembly didn't lead to a new primordial form, yeah. but to a recreation of the old one. We all we have now a set of discourses about plurinational state, but economy is the same. Uh, and the state is the same. So we have uh, what Zabaleta called apparent forms, a new set of apparent forms that say that we have overcome all the contradictions, but the real thing is that they have recreated in economy and state structure. Thank you very much, Luis. I thank you very much for the dialogue, the invitation, and everything. I felt very well all these days here. Thank you very much to all of you. We will invite you back. Don't worry.